Hi, I'm John Laspina. I'm the carb addiction teacher and also known as the seed oil oxalate and carb addiction teacher on YouTube. I added a couple little phrases because I've I'm learning a lot. And we'll just call this a mutual interview for my viewers and for your viewers. So introduce yourself. My name is Monique Attinger. I stumbled into the oxalate rabbit hole about 15 years ago. And managing oxalate in my diet and lowering oxalate in my diet was such a game changer that I went back to school, became a nutritionist. And wow. so that's the Reader's Digest version. Okay. Um, in fact, my young daughter was very sick. She was having these terrible rashes and things, nothing that made any sense to me. She wasn't my first kid. And so I was doing all the things I knew how to do with rashes and thinking like, I'm no dummy. Even then I was, I was interested in nutrition, even though I wasn't in the field, but something's going on here. I can't seem to get at. And I took her to our trusted naturopathic doctor we were seeing at the time. And he had treated me since before I was pregnant with her. And he says to me, she's got an oxalate problem. And I said, what's an oxalate? <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly enough, I would not have realized I had any kind of issue with oxalate, except I knew my daughter. I knew she wouldn't eat some different way from everybody else at the table. So I said to her, we're both going to eat like this. We'll just figure out how good it is. And I don't think in my life have I ever said more prophetic thing mm -hmm. because what I noticed was not only was she getting better, but I'd had issues with my thyroid, issues with my adrenals, issues with sleep, digestive problems, m muscle aches, joint issues like and so these are not all the same systems like you can kind of understand well if your thyroid's got a problem maybe your adrenals could have a problem and if you've got sleep issues that could be related to your gut so maybe your gut issues have some relationship there but we had a bunch of things where some of these things are not like the others and yet I watched all of them start to approve all at the same time and I went wow what's that. <laughs> right. And the more I learned about oxalate, the more I realized it could be running under the radar. You could be doing everything right and not getting better because you weren't really doing everything right. You thought you were. And oxalate was an under the hood disruptive factor that was affecting your energy, was affecting inflammation, was affecting, you know, how well your tissues were functioning and, and disrupting different kinds of parts of metabolism. And, you know, I think it's clear to us now that perhaps some of these standard conventional nutritional advices are not good, as you pointed out, seed oils and, you know, some of these other things that we've thought, well, this is going to be better for us. And I think the challenge here is that the conventional nutritional advice is eat more greens, up your vegetables, get enough grains, blah, blah, blah. And the ones we worship as superfoods, you know, we bow down to spinach and we bow down to all almonds and we bought and right. they, we're looking at the nutrient profile but we're not balancing with the anti nutrient profile. And I would argue oxalate's a big gun there. It's not that there aren't other anti-nutrients that can be problems as well, but because of the fact that it can disrupt both metabolic processes as well as cause physical damage from things like kidney stones, as well as be trafficked into tissues to disrupt in different places. We've now got indication that it's a mitochondrial toxin. We know how important the mitochondria are now. So this is, this is a message I want to get out to people because it's really important to me that people understand that they do not have a lemon for a body. Their genetics isn't messed up necessarily, but their diet might be because you're an independently mobile manufacturing facility. What you take in is not just fuel. Fuel would actually be benign in some ways. You would burn it off and it would be gone, right? No, no, no. This stuff is going in and producing the body you live in next week, next month, next year. And so I went from being so sick at 48 with a three-year-old and an eight-year-old, I thought I wouldn't live to see them grow up, to being 62 and never planning on retiring. That is a, a testament in itself. Absolutely. I came at it from a different angle. I ate the standard American diet until I was maybe 55 years old. And then I started going keto because I wanted to lose weight. That's the reason why a lot of people go keto. And I 
you know, I'm learning as I'm going along and I did not know. I had a lot of salads with spinach, a lot of spinach because spinach is good for you. I had a lot of almond flour keto snacks. I would make a smoothie because I needed magnesium because I had AFib and I was adding more electrolytes and I was pouring in the chia seeds and the cinnamon. Uh, oh, I was just taught. I didn't realize it, what I was doing to myself. Eventually I came down with a really painful calcium oxalate kidney stone. I had to go in the emergency room and they identified it. I have it. I passed it and saved it so I could have it identified as such. Then I had a dumping issue with my eye that I can't prove, but the optometrist doesn't know what it was. There's nothing scratching my cornea and it lasted about three weeks. It was horrible absolutely horrible. And just knowing what oxalates are now, I thought, oh, and I read about eye dumping possibilities. And I thought, I wonder if that's it. And then now that, like you mentioned, all of your things, I was thinking back on my life. And then recently as well, every once in a while, I would have this toxic feeling, this achy, almost like a flu-like symptom, but I didn't have a fever. I took a COVID test. I didn't have COVID. There was nothing wrong with me physically, but I felt toxic. And then it would pass in a couple of days. And it makes me wonder, is that an oxalate dumping issue as well? So I would love to be able to pinpoint this and say, this is oxalates, like we can with a kidney stone. This is oxalates. This is oxalates. So one of my questions for you is, is there a way now that we know a little more to identify that it is or it isn't? Yeah. See, the tough thing here is you don't find what you're not looking for. Uh, and so in terms of the research, Here's how it goes. So researchers will look for oxalate in the body when the kidneys have failed, mm. but they don't look before then. They're right. And so we know from the research on people who have oxalosis, where they're, they are essentially toxic with oxalate. And that can be either because of primary hyperoxaluria, where their body's producing oxalate or because they've got some kind of an acute poisoning with oxalate, which can happen with diet. When people have oxalosis, they will look for it elsewhere, but they kind of stumble into oxalosis oh, okay. only when renal information, renal tests show that kidney function is low then they'll mm. go looking for it elsewhere. But okay. up until that point, so there's only very limited research where we've got people who are actually saying, look, oxalate's the issue here. And people are not yet in kidney failure or having reduced renal function, and they've actually looked. And so there's a few pieces of research that I know of, one which has to do with the joints and arthritis, which... I believe the title of the research was update on crystal oxalate disease or something to that effect. You could probably find it that way. And essentially what the researchers suggest is if you've got somebody who's got arthritis and it seems odd, like you can't, you can't pinpoint a diagnosis or it doesn't act the way you'd expect it to, that they should be looking for calcium oxalate crystals in the joints. So that's one piece where they weren't looking at the kidneys first and saying, well, if the kidneys are good, everything's fine. Uh, and there's another piece of research, and this has to do with breast health, where they identified that oxalate's actually a trigger to breast cancer and that crystal microcalcifications in the breast can be oxalate. And that one, I do not know why the world is not blowing up on that particular really? because breast cancer is another one of those things that we Huge. consider epidemic. And what if what we're doing to be healthier is actually making us less well. And no one wants to answer that question in a research sense in terms of oxalate, unless the kidneys are starting to fail. And that it's too that's late. way too long yeah. afterwards, right? I ended up being, you know, toxic enough with oxalate by 48 that I knew I wasn't right. I figured I was on my way to a fibromyalgia diagnosis or mm. something because I just had so much stuff going on or a chronic fatigue kind of diagnosis. But if I'd have continued on that trajectory, you know, by the time they find it and the kidneys are starting to suffer, you're already been dealing with oxalate for maybe decades. And the idea idea that we can absorb it 
and as a toxin, it's a completely get out of jail free kind of toxin that just passes through and heads out. And we never show an ounce of curiosity what might be happening between absorption and excretion. To me, it's just astonishing that we aren't willing to even ask the questions. Hmm. I, I'm really surprised by the lack of curiosity. Yeah, That is. And so uh, the fact that you're on and the fact that I'm on and other people, have you heard of, of Elliot Overton? Oh, I, yes. Elliot Overton. Yeah, he's is, excellent. Yeah. He's so, been on the Triangle Oxalates groups for years. Oh, I've been a moderator there for years. Oh, okay. Sally Norton, who also right, was a right, member on the Triangle right. Oxalates group. So a lot of the people who are out there and who are practitioners or professionals of one kind or another and are getting the word out, most of us, if not all of us, owe our knowledge and our ground on this to Susan Owens, who yes. herself stumbled into this and because of her interest in sulfur chemistry and how oxalate messes with sulfur chemistry. Oh. And if not for some of the questions that she was smart enough to ask by connecting some dots, the rest of us would still be back at what's an oxalate. <laughs> right. So let's backtrack for sure. my viewers and for your viewers, kind of like your other videos as well. And part of my first question. So the reason that we're on talking is to get the, the message out because a lot of people just don't know. And I didn't know. So number one, if you can, from your knowledge as a nutritionist now, uh, explain for our viewers exactly what is an oxalate, where are they? And I think we know why they're bad, but I know what they are, but I would love to, my audience to hear it from you. Exactly what is this? I've learned that it's some of them are shiny and they reflect the light and help the chloroform and they draw in the chemicals and explain to the viewers exactly what they are. So we get it. Well, let's, let's, let's just do it at a high level because even I, right. well, I think you could get down into the science and could, yeah. for hours, right? But at a very high level, you have two forms of oxalate. One is a soluble form, which is the anion and it's very easily absorbed. So this is, this is the kind of oxalate in our diet that's most likely to get into the bloodstream. It's not the only one, but it's the most likely one. Soluble. The soluble. Okay. So that's dissolved in something. Okay. So that's going to pass more easily into our bodies. The insoluble, which is the kind of oxalate where it's already bound to a mineral. So you have a okay. compound, right? Calcium, oxalate, magnesium, oxalate, ferrous, oxalate. Those are all where oxalate's bound to a mineral. And then it becomes more insoluble. Can you still absorb that? If it's a single molecule, you sure as heck can. Yeah. But if it's in crystalline form, the danger to us there really is what's it doing to the gut? Hmm. So I, I remember eating spinach, for instance, and I remember hmm. there being kind of a squeaky feel on the teeth or a gritty feel on the teeth, right? Well, it's got a lot of this insoluble, essentially micro crystals, you know, of oxalate in that leaf. So think fine grade sandpaper yeah. going down through your gut, right? Uh. And we have, again, another epidemic, leaky gut. Who do you know doesn't have a leaky gut? Yeah. So we have these two basic forms. And as you pointed out, the crystalline form is used by the plant for a number of reasons, but not the least of which it helps to support photosynthesis. If I've got these crystals in my leaf and I can bounce that sunlight around a little bit, then maybe I can get more out of it, right? Mm -hmm. But it can also be used for other purposes by plants, not the least of which is protection against predation. When you get really high oxalate foods like spinach or say rhubarb. When I was a kid, everybody had a backyard rhubarb plant mm -hmm. and nothing ate those leaves. <laughs> <laughs> and now I know why. Gee, why? <laughs> really high oxalate. And so essentially that's a physical deterrent. Yeah. You actually break the mouth of the insect with the amount of micro crystals that are in mm -hmm. there. Either form of oxalate is not good for us. But the thing that soluble oxalate can do is once we've absorbed more of that, that can be easily trafficked in and out of the cells of the body. And a plant can be using it to draw minerals up out of the soil do things like that because oxalate's a mineral chelator and then the plant can sort of reabsorb it. But plants have pathways, metabolic pathways, essentially, that allow them to manipulate oxalate. 
we have no such pathways. So we cannot manipulate oxalate once it's in our body. Once it's in our body, it's either going to chew it up because it's crystals. So it's chewing up the gut. If it forms crystals, once it's inside the bloodstream, it will chew us up in there too. And the soluble stuff can be um, taken into the cells because we do understand enough about oxalate in terms of our own biochemistry that our body knows that it needs to secrete it out. It's not something we want to keep. We will produce a certain amount of oxalate, what they call endogenously. So what comes in from your diet is exogenous, right. but what we produce ourselves is endogenous. And that endogenous oxalate, we know how to get rid of it. We secrete it out into the bloodstream. The kidneys typically pick it up, not the only one. And then we get rid of it in the urine. But we're making, I'm not sure that we've got a, a like a final number from the research, but they kind of estimate that we make maybe 15 to 30 milligrams of oxalate, depending on the source that you look at. So a small amount. Per day? Per day, basically. Really? That sounds yeah, so, kind of high to me, though. Well, it, it would depend on other factors, how much oxidative stress there is in the body. Per, okay. how much Each person's what, different. Yeah. yeah. So, but really, in the grand scheme of things, a small amount. That's a small amount. Certainly nothing compared to the 400 milligrams you can take in in a half a cup of spinach, oh, right? Yeah. Or a half a cup of almond flour or, yeah. Rubber. So there's lots of things. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 750 milligrams in a half a cup of rhubarb. Oh like, my gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our baby amounts in our body or nothing. Okay. But that little bit means that our bodies know how to get rid of it. It's a metabolic end point and our bodies go right. Once we get to the end of a metabolic process and we've got oxalate potentially as one of the byproducts, Mm -hmm. And secretion is what we need. So it's an active transport. It's not a, necessarily a passive transport. With that said, the cell transporters for a cell that will pull in certain kinds of nutrients may also have the capacity to push out oxalate. But if that cell transporter has an ending here that will fit oxalate as well as some nutrient, the problem is if in the environment around the cell, there's lots of oxalate in that fluid, well, that cell transporter might go out and pick it up and pull it in. Mm. So we end up with this situation where we can actually be accumulating oxalate in an organ because we have cell transporters there who are capable of moving it. There's actually more around the cell than there might even be in mm. the cell when it starts. But once that oxalate's inside the cell, it needs energy to get rid of it. So you get this slowdown of perhaps the bandwidth for that cell and what it's supposed to be doing and an inability for that cell maybe to get rid of it as promptly as it would normally get rid of something that's a metabolic end product. So great examples are sulfate cell transporters, Mm -hmm. Many of the ones that move sulfate will also move oxalate. You have a, a similar problem with some bicarbonate transporters, cell transporters. A big consumer <laughs> of bicarbonate, like the pancreas, which is going to secrete enzymes, but also resources that are going to bring up the pH of that food as it exits the stomach. The pancreas is another possible location where people could end up with some oxalate stranded there, disrupting function and, you know, potentially. Essentially, we've got a situation where that chyme exiting the stomach is not going to be brought to the right pH level for the intestines. And it may not be enough to completely disrupt how the intestines function. But if it's at the wrong pH, that might drive inflammation for that leaky gut again. And maybe the pH is not optimal for us to absorb things. And in my mind, probably much more serious is the fact that sulfate transporters in the liver can pick up oxalate and gallstones can actually be oxalate stones. Really? Okay. And you can get liver stones that can also be oxalate. In All right. Not just kidney. No. So oh, we wow. can end up with oxalate accumulating and causing problems. Oh my gosh. Because of this business of you have to secrete it out. Mm -hmm. If you've got a fluid that it's going to accumulate in, 
then it can turn up as crystals there. So as I was saying, the breasts for some reason, okay. the joints may be at risk. And when you look at research where they look at people with primary hyperoxaluria, so that they've got a wow. real problem, their body's yeah. producing way more even than what's in a crazy high diet. And you know, transplantation is the thing that saves their lives. Mm-hmm. In their case, they we know oxalates accumulating in places like the eyes, in the arteries, in the heart, like all kinds of places where you don't want this stuff. So yeah, I think that we really underestimate how problematic this is. And also because oxalate itself is highly oxidative and we all know how bad oxidative stress is. Mm -hmm. And so there's just so many ways this can be functioning. And for us, it's not benign. For plants, benign, because they have metabolic pathways that manage it. We We do not. If we could break it down, be a whole different ball game. But our body is not in any way prepared for the kinds of levels that we can take in. It's prepared for 15 to 30 milligrams a day. It is not prepared for 1500. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Or, uh, and I know lots of people who came to me f- with paleo keto diets, where mm-hmm. once I put a stake in, in sort of a, an average of how much oxalate they were taking in, really high numbers. Oh really, my gosh. Really I bet. High. To explain this even better to our listeners, many people that I've tried to talk to or they've watched one of my videos, they say, Oh, I, I've never had a problem with it. So I don't have to worry about it. And I, my response to them is, Either did I until I did. So, Let's explain to them. I know we're going back to basics again. I kind of want to, I love that you explained everything in detail and I followed you, but what are the highest oxalate foods to stay away from? And then what are the lowest, like lettuce, what are the lowest oxalate foods that we can, you know, indulge in to be safe? Really high oxalate foods. I did do a couple of articles that are uh, on my website called the Oxalate Dirty Dozen. So Mm -hmm. I decided to do kind of that environmental working group kind of approach. What are the big bad guys. Right. People like them. Well, it at least gives them an idea. Mm-hmm. So we both mentioned spinach. We've right. both mentioned almond, rhubarb, crazy, stupid high. You know, you have some of the gluten-free options like teff, crazy, teff, stupid yeah. high, but even things like quinoa and buckwheat are really going to add up for you. Basically, when you talk about almonds, we really need to talk about most okay. nuts. Most nuts are a pretty rich source of oxalate. All right. Now, while we're there, because I I'm cutting out all the nuts, but I want, this is part of one of my questions. I love the Peely nut and the Sacha Inchi thinking I'm getting this amazing profile of the lowest carbs and the highest healthy fat. Do you have knowledge about these? I I Googled like crazy and can't find an oxalate content number on these two nuts. Well, we did actually test them through the trying low oxalates. Okay. I'm curious. Unfortunately, it's not great. It's Um, over one milligram of oxalate per gram of nuts for your peely nuts. For Peely. All right, great. Yeah. So so when you <laughs> when you talk about an ounce, that's over, it's looking at about 36 milligrams of oxalate for an ounce. So that's a lot because that's a lot. Of, it's not yeah. hard to use that much on a piece of bread to kind of get yourself a nice coating of your nut butter on right, it. Right. Right. But the other one that the Sacha, Sacha Inchi, Inchi, we do not appear to have tested that. Okay. We've only tested the oil. So this gives me a chance to talk about good guys for a second. Okay, good. Which is when it comes to being able to <clears throat> use an oil versus the whole food, all oils are low oxalate. So if you press the oil out, it's okay. Now, all that, oils are lo- all oils are low all oxalate, fat, but then all again, oils. We, and then we won't go into the seed oil discussion maybe for another time. So we want to watch day. that. Watch those oils though. But. but yeah, you can't, you really shouldn't be doing a lot of those. Right. And if you think about it, even from a natural cycle standpoint, those would have been once a year bonuses mm-hmm. and Nuts go rancid very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so you wouldn't be eating them for very long either. We have a capacity with modern food production, modern shipping processes and things like that to be able to eat things that are extraordinarily high oxalate and do it 365 days a year. And that is not something even a hundred years ago you would ever have been able to do. So back back to our bad guys. So most of the nuts are bad guys. There's the odd exception. There's something that's new on the market called a baru nut. 
Mm -hmm. I've had them. They're very addictive and they Uh, are higher in vegetable protein, higher in fiber, lower in carbs. So if somebody said to me, I really want to be able to eat a nut, I'd say, if you want something like this in your diet, that's the place to go. So an ounce of almonds is about 300 milligrams and the same ounce of baru nuts is about two. (laughs) Two. Yeah. Okay. B A R U. If I Google it. B A R U. So yeah. I can look for them if I want to try them. So I have to switch from my Peely to maybe my Barrow. Yeah. All yeah. Right. But we also have to keep in mind, like when it comes to foods, you don't have a low oxalate food that has an unlimited number on it. You never do unless the food is zero, in which case you can multiply it as many times as you want. You're not going to get more. But the ratings for foods are based on a serving size. So if you wanted to eat, not that I would advocate this for anybody, but if you wanted to eat one gram of almonds, that would be about you know, three to four milligrams of oxalate. And that would, that would <laughs> rate as a, as a low oxalate serving because it's under five milligrams, which is the cutoff. There's practicality and useful nutrition and reasonable serving size. Mm-hmm. And so in practice, there are some low oxalate foods where you could eat almost unlimitedly, but you really want to stay away from some of the seeds as well. Chia seeds are yeah. awful. I was doing a lot of those because I heard all the good stuff only about them and none of the bad stuff. Yeah. Yeah. We don't really do this cost benefit thing, right? Yeah. This much nutrition, we but this to. much anti-nutrition. I do think it's really warranted. And other greens like Swiss chard, Oh, also yeah. really bad beets and then the beet greens as beet well greens. also really bad some of the spices are really awful so that golden milk yeah. trend which is turmeric. still kind of out there with turmeric turmeric is sky high like one little teaspoon is about 70 milligrams in. talk to me about yellow mustard now i use yellow mustard when you look at the ingredients of a clean yellow mustard it doesn't even say natural flavors it says turmeric mustard seed vinegar water is the amount of turmeric in that and i don't know say a tablespoon of yellow mustard going to, should i stop doing that it's a little bit tough Because it kind of depends where it is in the proportion of the product, right? So if you've got a yellow mustard, a lot of them will have turmeric, but at the very end of the set of ingredients, is that Mm. going to be enough to kill you? No. But if it's turmeric first, you have more of that than you have anything else then you might be in trouble. So we're back to this serving side aspect. And with turmeric, it's not a lot before you're messing yourself up, but you do have some capacity to have a little bit, but you'd have to be really careful because yeah, one teaspoon, 50 milligrams. Of turmeric, a teaspoon? One teaspoon. So that's only a couple of grams. So this is one of the places where um, I can talk about the good guys and Uh the good guys are extracts. So if you get a turmeric extract, you can cook with that. You can get flavor with that. And in fact, at one point I had a bottle of curcumin, a supplement bottle in Mm -hmm. my spice rack because I took the capsules, I opened them up and I get my flavor that way. Mm -hmm. So not every bad guy is going to have to disappear from your diet forever. Sometimes there's a way to sub for that bad guy. So we'll just, I'll leave that out there with turmeric. Cinnamon's another one where you can have a really high oxalate in a small amount. So cinnamon extract can be a very good friend here. Mm. The other things which you have to think about, which nobody likes, is that chocolate. Chocolate. Is really Uh, hard. Yeah, I know. Everybody loves, most people love chocolate. Most people like chocolate. Uh, So the, the challenge with that one is really back to serving size. So a like a tablespoon of cocoa powder is going to be about 50 milligrams again. And so if you're getting a brownie that's made where they used cocoa as the flour, you are mm-hmm. in yeah. very bad shape. That's right? cups of it probably. Yeah. It's j- the amount of oxalate in like one little brownie. If it's like the equivalent of a quarter cup of flour, but you've used cocoa instead, you're already at a couple hundred milligrams of oxalate right before yeah. you talk about, well, when then we added some chocolate chips and then we added, you know. Right. So most people have the biggest difficulty with dealing with the fact that chocolates and especially dark chocolate, which we've all been told, especially in the keto world. Is healthier. 
this is your friend. That's right? actually worse. <laughs> yeah, it's actually worse. What about so, the the butter, the cacao butter? Because I have bought the the wafers that are just they're very light in color and there's no darkness to them. It's just the butter, and I melted that to get the chocolate flavor, and I make brown butter bites with it. Does that butter have that? Does the does the cacao fat have oxalates? It has very it has, little. So again, when we press a fat out of something, okay, the, the there is no oxalate to speak right. of in that. It's Thank only a, if there's plant matter that remains in. In an oil or a fat where then we have a bit of an issue. But that's orders of magnitude less okay. than the whole food or a dried food and the amount of oxalate that's in that. That makes sense. Didn't know that. So your clean 15 are the oils and the butters and your top five things are all going to be animal products. Yeah. Meat, fish, eggs, dairy. You just, you can't do better than zero. And those guys are all essentially zero. So if you get a whole unprocessed animal product, certainly if you're looking at a meat or a fish, that's going to be zero. If you're looking at something like butter, zero. If you're looking at milk, because it depends on the cow's diet, how much- right oxalate might be present in the milk. And so there can be trace amounts in dairy products, but by and large, you trace. know, it's not going to be anything that would put you over the limit unless you're going to sit down and eat a kilogram of cheese or yeah. something. So your animal products are definitely out in front, but you do have for those of us, especially who might like to eat a little bit of plant matter, you do have some really good, low oxalate, nutrient dense veggies. One of my favorites is bok choy got to be one of the best greens you could have. You know, you're getting that dark green kind of nutrition profile, but Mm -hmm. it's very low in oxalate and the stems make a great dip. Like for oh, things yeah. that you want to dip, like you've got this nice crunchy stem. Uh-huh. Right? Lettuces are great. Mm-hmm. Uh, virtually all the lettuces are low oxalate. And a lot of people don't realize you can actually cook those. So you can have it raw, but you oh. can also use it Wilt as them. an alternate yeah. green for something. How about broccoli and asparagus? Are they kind of uh, medium or are they those down are in the more lower? kind of medium? Medium. But they're not medium at the high end of that medium range. They're at the low end of that medium okay. range. And so those are things that I would freely include in a diet, unless you're already really sick, then you might want to be a little more cautious, but truly that's not how anybody gets an oxalate problem. They're going to be getting it from some of these other really high ones. Yeah. Yeah. Other really good things to consider radishes. You can eat them raw. You can eat them cooked and they're very low oxalate. Cauliflower, which is the darling of the keto world, is right. very low oxalate. Okay. Cabbage is very low oxalate. So you've got a lot of potentially really good options. And if you mm. like some color, red and green peppers, oh, peppers. are going to be low to medium. And I'm actually thinking about my garden right now because I grow yeah. stuff. Oh, do you? Yeah. Arugula, great leafy green. Um, Again, very low. Most of the squash family, they may sometimes kind of toe into that medium Medium. range, but honestly, nutrient dense, really low. So there are a lot. There's a lot of low ones we can enjoy. There are a lot of them. Going to keep the highest ones out is, is what people need to do. Yeah. And so for most people, the challenge is not that there aren't lots of options. It's Mm -hmm. that they feel deprived because the thing they used to eat lots of, they can't eat lots of. So it's more a process of evolving your shopping list, if you will, because people are so predictable with their shopping list. Like they think they eat a lot of variety, but they're buying probably the same things all the time, right? And so instead of going in and buying carrots, because carrots can be a little bit higher, but you can Mm -hmm. boil them and keep them in the medium range. But if you're eating raw carrots, that can add up on you. Right. And- cooking now, you just mentioned that. So, 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 uh, soaking and cooking and lessening the oxalic acid. Can you talk about that? The thing with cooking is that we often think that a food is better raw, but that's not always true. And in fact, a lot of traditional ways of processing foods turn out to release an important kind of thing that we wouldn't have had in the raw version. Like a great example is you cook a tomato because you get the lycopene and you don't get the lycopene if you don't cook the tomato. Don't overdo tomatoes. They add up really quickly on the oxalate. Oh, do they? Okay. Yeah, they do. There's a there's a couple of older varieties, brandy wine tomatoes, which I love the taste, but they are an ugly tomato 
because they tend to split and get scars and oh, do I've things. Seen those. But they're really tasty. Well, so tomato sauce. Tomato sauce a- is a is a bad one because you're going to oh, concentrate all the oxalate. Concentrate in. it. So cooking alone doesn't break it down. I've had people say to me, "Oh, I cook my vegetables. I'm fine." Okay. No, it's not reliable in any way to cook a vegetable and assume that you're going to lose a lot of the the oxalate that's in there. The most reliable ways to have that oxalate be reduced is soaking, which you alluded to. So if I want to eat, gosh, say something like millet, where it's not super high oxalate, but it can get up there if you're having a larger serving. So you soak it first, you throw off the soaking water, you've leached some of that soluble oxalate out into the water, then you cook it, and then you're going to be in a much better position in terms of I can have kind of a reasonable serving and I'm not escalating my oxalate. And you can do the same thing with things like carrots. Carrots raw, if you really love raw carrots, you can start to have a fair bit of oxalate that you're taking in just with that. Mm -hmm. But if you take peel, chop into fairly small pieces and boil, and you want the the pieces fairly small because the more surface area, area. the more soluble you're able to get out. And then that'll keep it more medium oxalate with carrots. So there there are things you can do from cooking from that standpoint, which will take some foods, which may be a little harder to incorporate into your diet in any reasonable serving if you want to stay like really textbook low oxalate and you can bring them into a level where they're going to work for you. And for something like tomato sauce, I'll just throw out there, I split half tomatoes and half butternut squash and you get a really fun oh, that's sauce. That's a good way to do it. Okay. Well, yeah. I love tomato sauce. Oh. No, there's, there are ways to get there around. Ways to like get around I said, it. if I take my own tomatoes that I grow, my brandy wines, and I add those to butternut squash and then I cook them down, I've started Whoa. with the butternut squash already cutting the oxalate in half. Okay. And then there are things you can do like extracts for your spices. So if you take the level of oxalate that's in the spice, even if it's not that high, but if you bring that down, then you have room for the ingredients. There's a certain amount There's of ways uh, to do it. here that goes okay. on. Okay. Right? How about yeah. oregano and basil? Those are uh, staple spices a lot of people use. Um, yeah, and they're not terrible, they're but not terrible. they are like oregano starts to get up into that medium range. Okay. So for as many spices as I can get a good alternative, I'll use some kind of an extract. Okay. And actually, one of my favorites is this company out of the UK, and they call themselves Holy Lama Spice Drops. And what I love about these things is we tested turmeric, we tested cinnamon, we tested cumin, some of the big guys, mm-hmm. but flavors that we really love here in North America. And those spice drops were zero oxalate. So you oh, can wow. do that. And you're getting you're getting the flavor that you're and, and it's zero. Yeah. That's interesting that you can get that. We were really overjoyed, those of us who found out about these things and then went, well, it's an extract and let's see how good this is. Okay. And they have a nice full flavor. So sometimes a dry extract might lose something in translation, but this is a drop and it's, they're very good. Now, so these are in al- an alcohol base, like a vanilla? No, they're actually in another base. I'd have to check again what they're using. It's very flavorful, but it's not my favorite base, but I figure a couple of drops. It's not like I'm adulterating my food with something really awful. Mm. And where I can use things like a dry extract, like turmeric as a dry extract works yeah. fine. So I play with who the, the people are starring in my recipes, so to speak. Okay. How do they measure the number of oxalates in a plant? Like we know, like you mentioned rhubarb, I think it was rhubarb has 700 milligrams of oxalates per half That's cup. Crazy. How do we know that number? How do they actually, how do this, the biologists or the scientists, the botanists, how do they measure how do we know the number? I'm curious. There, There is a test. I think it's called Sigma that's used to figure out oxalate in a plant. And while I quote some numbers, we are not far enough along to know averages. Okay. So when you go to nutrition data online or places like this and you look up calories, they don't tell you from this much to this much is the calorie in your serving. 
but that's what they should tell you. They should. They give you as an average number, okay. but we've tested chicken breast so many times that the average is pretty solid. We have a pretty right. good idea where that data clusters. And so we can give you a pretty accurate representation. We are nowhere close to that with Oxlate. So what I would say to you is that there's lots of people out there. There's lots of people with lists. And, and they're not always the same. Some and of they're them not totally always the contradict same. each other. So, so what the, you need to do is look where the data is clustering between your lists. The, the I often, yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. So I often look at like an average, but if I get something that's a huge outlier, mm -hmm. then I might incorporate that into my average just to allow for in case this huge outlier is not a mistake in testing or something else, right? But I'm hoping over time, the Triangle Oxlates group of which I still volunteer at is working towards trying to do multiple tests of foods and test them uncooked in their either fresh or dried form so that we start to understand what's the oxalate that's in there, how does cooking change it? So do they have a, it's a device or is it, is it a chemical reaction that gives them a number? How do we arrive at the number? I don't understand enough about the details of how the testing works, but okay. I do believe that what they're doing is a chemical exactly. reaction okay. to get the number because they need to get total oxalate because we're not just reporting on soluble and we're not just reporting okay. on insoluble. You really need to know that total number. For the viewers. Many of us drink coffee. Coffee comes from a legume, a bean. We know that beans are high in oxalates, correct? All beans, the, the reason that we're supposed to a soak lot of the them. beans. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we soak beans to get the lectins, the phytate, whatever, the, the anti-nutrients out oxalates are one of those. But what about the coffee bean? We're not soaking them. No, but we've tested drip coffee. We tested instant coffee. We tested espresso. Okay. And? and I laughingly say that my... Proof of God's existence is that they're, really low. <laughs> they're all low. So unless Thank you're you. <laughs> yes, the only thing I don't know yet is for those people again with the chocolate thing, but chocolate covered coffee beans. I right. cannot say that those are safe, but can I say that coffee's okay? Yes, it is. I used to eat those. Oh, they were so good. <laughs> so good. <laughs> So uh, filtered versus unfiltered, like French press versus filtered. Any difference is the filtering? I don't know that we've got a good enough set of data to say that. Espresso, you've got the water being pressed through, you know, high pressure, high heat. Right. And even there, we don't seem to extract too much oxalate. So I'm assuming, regardless of how the liquid is being handled with the beans, that we don't have that big a difference. So I just had an aha moment because you taught me just now, during the last hour, about the oils and whenever we're expressing them, that, that they're zero to almost none. And that's why coffee is so low, because we're not really eating the bean. We're getting the oil out of the bean into the water and we're drinking that. So, okay, wow. Now I get it. It's an, it's <laughs> An extraction process. Yeah, it's an right? extraction process. Okay. And universally, whenever we extract, so oils are zero, but extracts are always at least orders of magnitude less. So one example where it was still medium oxalate was ashwagandha. So we were looking at different supplements. Mm -hmm. So the whole herb like sky high, milk thistle, the whole herb, sky high. Like, really, milk thistle is highly recommended for people to cleanse their liver. And it is shockingly high. And we're, and, but yet nobody talks about the detriment. Oh my gosh. But if wow. you get a milk thistle extract, extract, then you're okay. So the bulk of the oxalate in something like milk thistle really has to be insoluble because there's really good data that we've got on this one uh, was certainly well enough that I would feel very comfortable saying this, but the milk thistle seed, one teaspoon, teaspoon, teaspoon. Well, no, it has to be more than that because that's, that looks wrong. Well, one teaspoon. I've got another one here, milk thistle powder, one teaspoon, five grams, 90 milligrams of oxalate. 90. Wow. Yeah. But if you look at something like, like a, just a standardized extract, your one capsule is like 
0.05 milligrams. So orders of magnitude. Different. It depends. It depends. I've heard that vitamin C supplements contain high oxalates. They don't actually contain oxalate. This is biochemistry. This okay. one. Vitamin C, antioxidant firefighter in the body. Body tends to throw it at things when we've got things going on. First oxidation, it becomes dehydroxy, big long name for vitamin C. Second oxidation, it throws a molecule of oxalate. From endogenously or whatever's there? Just by the in. natural degradation pathway of vitamin C. So vitamin I, C. Would you say if somebody takes a lot of supplements of vitamin C, I used to take a lot every day just to thinking I was being safe and didn't yep. take it just when I had a cold, would that have been detrimental? Absolutely. To my, absolutely. Yep. Uh, research shows that a dose of, I believe, 500 milligrams, they tracked that at least half of it became oxalate. Oh my gosh. So if okay. you're taking 500 milligrams of vitamin C a day, and this is assuming that you don't have more of it degrade into oxalate because you're under more oxidative stress because mm -hmm. then you've got more opportunities for it to be oxidized, right? So just a 500 milligrams a day, which does not seem like that much, I'm sure to most people, 250 milligrams of oxalate. That's a good wow. solid. Would you recommend if someone has a cold, a sore throat to only take a vitamin C at that time or still not take it? I do have vitamin C on hand. I have a 250 milligram capsule. Mm -hmm. And what you really want is for that vitamin C to be recycled. We don't make our own vitamin C, right? right? Most mammals do make their own vitamin C. We do not. So we need to get it exogenously. That's our only option, but we recycle it. So mm. our systems are really efficient if we give them the resources to take that oxidized vitamin C, catch it before it becomes oxalate and oh. recycle it back up. And to do that, you need CoQ10. You might want to look at ALA. You might want to look at vitamin E, which is the fat soluble pair to vitamin C, zinc, which we often recommend for colds. All these kinds of things can help to recycle the vitamin C back up to a better level. And oxidizing CoQ10 is not going to give you oxalate. Oxidizing vitamin E is not going to give you oxalate. Just C. Just the C. Yeah. Any of the but B vitamins? Now, just C. Just C. This okay. is the only one that degrades with this particular pathway. It's now known to be one of the things that causes risk of kidney stones too. Oh my gosh. All right. People need to know this. It, it's really important because no one it, knows. we really think that if some's good, more is better. And right. that's just not the case with a lot of these things. And vitamin C is definitely one, of, one those. of those cases where I would never go higher with it ever. Good information. People need to know. People need to know all of this. So when people come back to me again with that same question, I never have a problem with it. And you often also hear if you've had a calcium oxalate kidney stone, you're more likely to have them in the future. So you're the one, you are the one who needs to eat low ox foods, but not other people. That's what I hear. And I keep saying to them until it happens to you, why take that chance? They, they may be building up in your system now and you think it's something else. You think you're Absolutely. getting old. Yeah. We blame all sorts of things on you. Our joints are not as good. I don't have as much energy. I don't sleep as well. We blame all this stuff on aging. So at 48, I slept awful. I had no exercise resilience. I had, you know, very poor immunity. We were talking about some of the stuff at the beginning, yeah, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm 62. I got good bounce now. Like something doesn't set me back the same way. And wow. like even stress resilience is different because I have bandwidth. I have capacity. And we assume that somebody hits their 60s. Oh, if you're a bit slow and you got some arthritis, that's just normal aging. That's what we hear. That's but exactly what, what people say. Mm -hmm. What if it's not? What if right? it's not? I got off oxalate. I lost weight. I think some of that was just pure inflammation. It's just been a whole new ball game. And my kids are amazing testimony because the, the woman they remember as their mother when they were kids is not the woman that they've got as a mother now. Wow. And so they help to remind me of how different it is, even to the fact that a lot of their friends don't believe I'm the age that I am, but I was late oh, when wow. I was a kid. So, you know, but their friends say, oh, your mom can't be that old. She does all kinds of stuff. 
Yeah. You're a testament. You're a testament. The the now people who are having an oxalate dumping issue, they have kidney pain. They they may know that it is oxalates. I have heard that if it's if it's a very painful, horrible feeling to slow the dumping discomfort down is to actually eat some oxalates. Can you talk about that? Yeah, you can. This is not something you want to do all the time, but it okay. is a way for you to moderate what's happening. Moderate it. Yeah. So the thing with oxalate is really this. It's almost like, you know, what some people experience with allergies. Oh, I've been able to eat apples my whole life and suddenly I can't eat tree fruit. Why would this happen to me? And I suspect stress on the body can set you up for histamine issues. It's another thing we can talk about because oxalate plays in that field too. But the thing you're most likely to get an allergy to is a thing you've already been exposed to right? Mm -hmm. So there's some parallels to that with oxalate in the sense that you can't have an oxalate problem if you do not have oxalate stored on board. You cannot experience oxalate dumping without having oxalate stored in your tissues. And so if somebody does something as simple as cut a bunch of oxalate out of their diet, and that's all they've done, they haven't changed their supplements, they haven't done anything else. Mm -hmm. All the, that's the only lever they pulled. Anything happens after that, you've essentially proved you have an oxalate problem because you've proved that it's stored there someplace. Now that could go one of two ways if people pull this little experiment. The first few couple of weeks or so, yeah, I think probably about two after I reduced oxalate, I felt like a whole new woman. So you get that honeymoon experience right? where suddenly as much oxalate's not coming in and your body hasn't yet gone, oh, now I can get rid of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And you get this honeymoon and then you start to feel crappy again. That's another one where I'd say you're kind of proving that you have an oxalate. You had it. The challenge for us is slow and relentless bioaccumulation. So I did write an article on this because there is some interesting research. And the one that I thought was most telling was the one on thyroids. So there was a bunch of researchers who took thyroids and they basically examined the tissues in order to see how much oxalate was present in the thyroid. And what they found was, and these were thyroids that were donated by families for whose family member had passed away. They weren't even done the project yet. Um, and they reported in the study that they were already able to tell you the age of the person based on how much oxalate was in the thyroid. Wow. So if it's not affecting anything else in your body, how could it be accumulating in the thyroid? Yeah. What we really have to start to try to figure out is ways to identify oxalate. And I'd argue by detective work, because obviously you're not going to go in and biopsy everything. And you may not see it in the urine because the amount in the urine can depend on how much is being secreted and it can do this. And so most of us have experienced having what we call the oxalate dump as kind of a wave of oxalate moves from some tissues, it hits the bloodstream and then the body's got to try and deal with it. But then the dump happens and then it clears, you clear that wave. And then you may get a certain amount of time where you feel maybe even essentially normal, but then you get another wave of it again. So that there's this interesting sort of pattern that can be in place. And that may not be right from the beginning. Some people, they lower oxalate because they've been taking in thousands of milligrams a day. The, the wave just goes on and on and on and on and on and stays oh, up there because okay. they've got so much to so move. much mm -hmm. so then really the game is how do we support that body to handle that work because you may not be getting the breaks in between it's really insidious because it's under the hood we're not looking for it we don't expect it. If somebody says, I've got heartburn, they're not looking for oxalate, they're looking for H. pylori, or they're looking for other things, right? If somebody says, I've got joint issues, they're not looking for oxalate, they're looking for psoriatic arthritis, or maybe they're looking for rheumatoid or their osteoarthritis. So you don't find what you don't look for. So right. that's Problem number one, but problem number two is how do we get at this when secretion handles how oxalate gets moved? And while the kidneys are most likely to do the lion's share of the work, there is research that shows that we could be secreting it back into the gut for disposition. So you can actually get an intestinal stone, which mm. is a calcium oxalate stone. Ugh. You could be secreting it out through the skin. I have people- Itchy, in, right? In my clientele who get rashes or itchiness, and my daughter was a rash gal. Mm -hmm. You can be secreting it of all body places back into the lungs, into the mucus to get rid of it that way. So my oh. son 
was a kid who wheezed when he was moving oxalate. He he was getting rid of it out of here, out of this part of the body. So it's all about knowing more about the cell transporters, about why some tr- cell transporters would be able to do this and some would not. There does seem to be typologies, if you will. Some people are more likely to be able to move it out through the gut versus others or through the lungs versus others or through the skin versus others. So Is it still- drawn? Are the oxalates traveling, moving, looking for the ions, the, the, uh, the calcium, is that why they move to certain areas? Like what, um, the, for certain is, people? It is a chelator, right? But I don't know that we've got indication of that, that the chelation function is actually taking it to certain tissues. Okay. It looks right now like it has to do with cell transporters and cell our, transporters. our cell transporters ability to actually move the oxalate. And if oxalate's more plentiful in the environment around that cell than it is inside the cell, and that cell transporter goes out to look for sulfate, bicarbonate, chloride, like different kinds of things where it can also has the capacity to take oxalate, move it back out, you you can get essentially mistaken identity. It's, it picks up, it's looking for something else, but so this fits that ending and away it yeah. goes Wow. This has been outstanding. You have answered a million questions that I could not find the answers to on Google or in some people's YouTubes. And what else would you like to share before we leave? Or if you want to keep on going, and I want to come back and talk to you about seed oils at a future talk. because Yeah, we'll definitely have to do that. Maybe I'll just tie it up a little bit because it can be a lot of material to absorb all at once. It is. It is a lot. For sure. What I want people to know is you're better off to reduce oxalate slowly. If you're not sure how to do that, get somebody to help you. And there's more than one way to skin this particular cat. Terrible analogy but or a terrible saying, but that could be as simple as my baseline diet I take to a low to medium range for daily intake. Low range would be 40 to 60 milligrams of oxalate okay. uh, like that I'm taking in by diet. Some people do quite fine at a medium oxalate intake and mm-hmm. That would be a place I'd start as my baseline, but mm-hmm. you might want to have every few days do an add in of a big serving of something that's higher. And mm-hmm. what that does is keep your body kind of paying attention to the oxalate that's coming in because we don't know exactly how this works, but it's been characterized so many times on the trying low oxalate support group. We know there's some kind of signaling that goes on there. So if the gut's got a lot of oxalate in it or there's oxalate hitting the bloodstream, the tissues aren't necessarily going to let go and dump unless their saturation point is so high, they can kind of come up over the threshold. I do find some people do well. They've got a baseline diet. They've got certain foods they're going to use to give them a bump up every two or three days. And then they slowly bring that bump up down right? Reduce the serving or sub other foods or there's that kind of approach. The other kind of thing, but this depends again on your personality and style and what you handle better, but is sort of the slow, relentless, I'm going to come down say 50 milligrams a week and I'm going to do that as long as it takes. So I had one client who started with me and she was at 330 milligrams of oxalate a day. No, no, 3,300, sorry. Well, even 300 is is high. Yeah. Oh, 300. She was at 3,300. That's probably where I was too. (laughs) And um, she came down 10 milligrams a day. Okay. Slow and steady. And she weighed and measured everything. And she essentially ate the same way every day. And she would stop when a big oxalate dump would hit. So it took her like over a year, that little bit, and then pause if there was a lot of dumping going on. And then that little bit again, and she was relentless. So some people can do it that way, but you really have to know what your own preferred approach would be and how flexible you want to be and how methodical and organized you want to be. I really like the idea myself of, okay, I'm going to shoot the bulk of my diet here and I'm going to have add-ins that take me up higher and then I'm going to slowly scrape those out over time. And you would not recommend somebody who just has been eating oxalates all their life to go pure carnivore and cut it to zero. That's going to cause some killer dumping. Now, see, Uh, I, I am a carnivore now. Uh But I was a carnivore after I'd been 10 years low oxalate. 
So you you did the step down slowly. Uh, to I get had to already where you done. Are. I had already done all the hard work, okay. right? So I think that there's a lot of discussion on the carnivore groups about things like adaptation okay. and people mm-hmm. being told things like you know just double down on how much meat you're eating or. You know, things like that when they report terrible symptoms. And I think we need to understand, particularly for those people, they have nosedived. There's all this oxalate leaving their body. So really what we want is for people to be able to take perhaps therapeutic doses of supplements to help their body handle the work they're doing. And perhaps they also need to take a certain amount of higher oxalate something. So let's say I want to become a carnivore, but maybe I'm willing to have a golden milk every day, which is 150 or 200 milligrams of oxalate. There might be a way where we can get a concentrated oxalate source that will allow you to still be able to come down in your oxalate fairly slowly, but start to get some of the benefits of the nutrient density of carnivore. But I think the whole carnivore world is ignoring that adaptation is not maybe adaptation and Mm -hmm. that maybe we should be telling people, gee, if you're having problems with your heart rhythm and your mineral levels are messed up, maybe you need to take some supplements or maybe you need some B vitamins to support the kind of work your body's doing because we really don't understand how much work our body has to do in order to cope with this stuff. And it's highly oxidative. It's disrupting mitochondria. It's doing all these things that we know are really bad. And so we should be supporting people to do carnivore slowly and maybe even do it in a way where they're slowly taking plant matter out of their diet, but they're eating day one. Maybe they're having something as high as a spinach or something like that, where they're getting a really big hit of oxalate. And then maybe they've got a mid-range day where eh, maybe they have some sweet potato, but they're not after that spinach. Yeah, we and didn't then, talk potatoes. They're up there too. They're yeah. up there too. And then, you know, have like this medium oxalate, but their lowest day in kind of a wave formation to kind of keep their body responsive. Because in the same way that you can get adapted to a workout that you just keep doing the same workout over and your over again, just, mm-hmm. if your body sees, oh, this is the new homeostasis, all she's taking in for oxalate is this much. So now I can start moving oxalate out Mm. at the speed I want to. No, no, no. You want to keep it guessing a little bit. Oh, nope. I can't do anything now because she's up again. Oh, and there. And that can be really helpful for some people in moderating symptoms. But we want to dump. We want to get it out of our system, but we want to do it slowly is what you're saying. We want to moderate it moderate it so we're not in pain. Yeah, because uh, you can get really sick. I landed in the ER. I've had oh, clients yeah. land in the yeah, ER. I did. Mm-hmm. This is not fun. And it can be life-threatening for some of us. Like I hit mm-hmm. the ER with my blood pressure at 230 over 130. No, that's oh. not funny. Oh my goodness. No, and that's not a typo. 230 over 130. So we just want to do this smart. Do we want that toxin out of our body? Of course we do. But in the same way that heavy metals can be dangerous, you can't chelate Mm -hmm. constantly because if you've got a lot of heavy metals in there, that stuff's getting a second kick at the can as it leaves your body. Oxalate's got that Mm -hmm. same kind of capacity where it's got a second kick at the can as it leaves your body. So it's as toxic on the way out as it was on the way in. It's just our health is at a very different position. So when I ate high oxalate foods in my 20s, I had capacity I did not have in my 40s and 50s right? Mm -hmm. So that bioaccumulation, we need to be respectful of the fact that that can be a big ticket item and that our resilience and our bandwidth and our ability to handle our life has to be respected as well. So we we have to work within our constraints there. Absolutely. Tell us your services, my viewers and your viewers. I saw you have a website, you have a service, people can, uh, a Patreon. Tell us all about how you help people who are seeking a diet plan to lower their oxalates. So I've tried to make like a stair step that people can kind of climb and decide where they need to be on it. So no cost at all. I volunteer on the Triangle Oxalate Support Group and I have a YouTube channel. And I also participate with three other professionals who have also been in the field for over a decade. And we are on YouTube as the Wizards of Ox. 
And oh, so I'll look for that. We've got the group there. So you get other people's perspective as well. Right, right. And you've got my own. I tend to try not to use the highly scientific language. I want people to be able to find the material accessible. So my YouTube channel is there as well. The next step up would be probably my Patreon group. And there I try to give people some options in terms of what they want. I have a level at which you can get recipe hacks and uh -oh. short articles and pictures pictures of meals at my house so that you start to get some ideas and you start to understand a bit about the playing field. If you really need some dietary support, I actually have a level at which I post a menu plan every month. So people can see, I consider these an education in and of themselves because people can see how I put together a menu plan, the notes on the recipes, I give them notes on the menu plan, and it gives them a way to start to think about what they want their diet to look like. And I try to accommodate different kinds of restrictions. So I might have a low oxalate, low histamine one. I might have a low oxalate, low salicylate one. I have things that are dairy-free and egg-free, like I'm great free, blah, blah, blah. I'm trying to make sure that people can find something. It may not be perfect for them, but it's close enough that they can work with it. And those would be two or three days, each of those menu plans. And there's 50 of them up there. Oh, so wonderful yeah, they got lots of options. And then I've got a third tier where I do research articles. So I let people in on my thought process and I'll give them the research pieces and sort of show them how I'm trying to connect the dots in different topics. And they get access to some videos that aren't anywhere else. And so okay. that allows people to kind of pick where they want to be in there. I'm doing some group coaching kinds of work and we've got some canned courses underway through the Wizards of Ox. So that would be the oh. next step. And then above that, the group coaching I do is live. So we'll have canned things, but I, I do group coaching live every so often. So that gives people access to me and I'll give them kind of an introductory course. And I usually do an, a dietary overlap because most people need more than just low oxalate. So I'll do low oxalate and keto or low oxalate and histamine or low oxalate and salicylate, stuff like that. And then it's one-on-one -on -one coaching, but you know, people can find out more at www.lowoxcoach.com and they can find me on patreon.com as low ox coach. Facebook, that support group is my pay it forward volunteer work. So people can some sometimes get, you know, some help there from me or other people who are, you know, a lot further down the road on this thing than they are and can give them some pointers. This has been outstanding and, and a wealth of knowledge. And I thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you agreeing to do this. Oh, John, and... I, just, I just so appreciate being asked because this is my passion. And I want people to be able to get the benefits from their diet that they're putting so much effort into right. and yet not getting better, right? right? I was in that place. I don't say lightly that I didn't think I would live to see my kids grow up. I thought I had a lemon for a body and I'd bequeath that to them because of my mm. genetics. And it has been nothing short of life changing. I ain't going anywhere till I'm 90. I'm going to be able to pester my grandchildren, there even though I had kids late. You can have the body that you want, but you need to build it with the materials with, that it right. deserves. And what we don't realize is these anti-nutrients. Anti-nutrients, right. They Instead are of not, looking at just the nutrients, nutrition, we need to look at the anti-nutrients. And it's no got to be a cost benefit, right? It can't be them. one or the other. Absolutely. This has been great. Thank you. So as I mentioned before, I would love to do maybe other, not just uh, seed oils. We could do salicylates. We could do histamines. I, I watched your histamine video. Fascinating. Uh, I want to know more. I want to know more. So hopefully there's more in the future for us here. Sure. Let's do it. We can have a series. <laughs> oh, all right. Let's do it. Great. All right. Uh, thank you so much. You're and, welcome, uh, John. And I will see you hopefully again soon.